So Brian's going to lead on the next part of the discussion. And Brian is the president of the Lewis Carroll Society, um, an author, and he's an ex-chairman of the Lewis Carroll Society as well. As you met him in the first part, he's extremely knowledgeable about, um, about Lewis Carroll and his works. So actually for the authors, if you have questions as well of Brian, Caroline or me, feel free to put them into the chat box as well. I meant to say that before. OK, so I'll hand over to Brian now and you can... Um, Thank you, Steve. Um, I love Battenberg cake, by the way, and uh, I was always, when I was young, puzzled by the fact that Martin Luther apparently existed on a diet of worms, but I'll leave you to check that out for yourself. Um, the, the poem, the, the chapter which I enjoy most, although it's very difficult for me to say, I, I had a friend who, was, who knew C.S. Lewis very well, and uh, he was once asked which of C.S. Lewis's Nar Chronicles of Narnia did he like the best? And he said, I like the best, the one that I'm reading at the moment. And I always thought that was a really good reply when you're put in a difficult situation. Uh, I don't know whether I like Looking Glass or Wonderland better than the other one, uh, except when I'm reading the one that I'm reading. So when I'm reading Wonderland, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I love it because it was so clever and it was so original and so fresh and new when um, the story was told and then written down and then published. Uh, unexpectedly uh, a success really for, it, for its author, uh, whose name of course was not Lewis Carroll, but Charles Lutwidge Dodson. Um, but when I'm reading Looking Glass, uh, I think that that's probably the better book. Uh, and of course, it's not as well known. And some of the many, many books of, of uh, the Alice stories appear. They're called Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. So Looking Glass is a kind of add on extra, a bonus, like a bonus disc on a, on a, on a video that you might buy. Uh, but, but for me, it's probably the better book because it's, it's one which Lewis Carroll worked at, not just because he told a story, uh, on on the spur of the moment to the three girls that he was rowing down the the river with in Oxford, but that because he was actually creating a story and working out what he wanted to do. So it's it's in many ways a much more polished story, which is probably why I like it. So I'm very fond of this chapter. Oddly, it's a chapter which uh, Steve chose as well, which is the the episode in Through the Looking Glass where Alice goes out into the garden from the Looking Glass house and meets the the uh, the, the live flowers. And I, I love the way in which Lewis Carroll handles anthropomorphism, you know, where things that are inanimate, like flowers, uh, or indeed animals like cats and fawns and so on, uh, are able to talk and communicate. And, and this the picture illustrating it is by an artist called Mary Blair, who was one of the concept artists for Walt Disney's 1951 film version of Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and it, I think it's an episode in the film uh, of that of the book, which I particularly enjoy, although I like a lot of the film, even though sometimes it strays quite a long way from Lewis Carroll and brings in, of course, characters from Looking Glass, like here, the live flowers, into the story of Wonderland. So for me, it's always a battle, which is best, Looking Glass and Wonderland. But I'm going to say Looking Glass today because we're celebrating the 150th anniversary of that book. So uh, I was thrilled by the entries. Uh, Caroline's already given you a very clear idea of the breadth of the stories we got. Um, I would just add one which I particularly liked. Um, well, two, actually. I think there were two stories, uh, maybe more, actually, because we had a lot of entries. Uh, certainly there were two which featured a bishop and a rook. Now, a rook, as you know, is the name for the castle piece in a chess game and Alice Through Looking Glass is based on a chess game. So there's, there's, there were a couple of stories that had rooks in them and I liked that. They were rooks that were birds, but they were also, uh, there were rooks that were towers and I thought that was very clever. And there was at least two stories, I think, with bishops in them. And somebody once said, well, how curious that Lewis Carroll talks about lots of the other chess pieces, knights, kings, queens, but doesn't actually talk about the bishops because the bishop is a, an important piece on the chessboard. And some people have said, well, because Lewis Carroll was also a clergyman, as well as being all the other things that he was, he was a, a member of the Church of England, uh, and probably he wouldn't want to make fun of the church. So uh, that's why he didn't use a bishop. But I don't think he was that averse to uh, bishops being made fun of. 
uh, because he allowed John Tenure to do a drawing. If you look at the, the original book of Looking Glass, you'll find a picture early on where all the chess pieces are, are running around on, in the grate in the Looking Glass house when Alice first goes through the, through the mirror. Uh, and she sees there, courtesy of Mr. Tenniel, Dodson doesn't mention it, she sees a bishop sitting on a newspaper, read, sitting on a piece of coal, reading a newspaper, presumably the Church Times. So the fact that he allowed uh, John Tenniel to put a bishop into one of the pictures, I think indicates that he wasn't actually, maybe he didn't want to write about one, but he wasn't that distressed at seeing a bishop in one of the pictures. So a couple of people brought bishops in as well. But as, as Caroline has said, the diversity of the entries and the quality of them uh, was fantastic. So if we can have the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the, the first of the entries in the over 20s. Uh, and this is Madra from Omaha. Are you there, Madra? You're, you're, you're muted, I think. I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> you're, here I, you're here and I can hear you. Uh, you're, you're in Omaha, Nebraska. And yep. how, how, do you remember, uh, as a, was it as a child or were, were you grown up when you first read the Alice books? Uh, I believe I was grown up when I first read Alice books. I, I was more familiar with the cultural references first, like Disney and so on. Ah, right, right. And then, and then when I did read Alice, I think it was college, but uh, I've read it several times since then. <laughs> what, what's the appeal of the book? Because when you say you've read it several times, I know lots of people who have read it many, many, many times, you know, and it's one of those books that it seems you can go back to and read again with just as much pleasure. What, what, why is that, do you think? Well, uh, because Alice's little, tid well, not just Alice, the little tidbits of wisdom, you know, hit you differently at different points in your life. And I will say at the beginning of the pandemic, I went back a lot to classics. That was my escapism, right? I've read Treasure Island and I read, you know, Alice again. And I, I really escaped back in time thinking, well, they lived through everything. We can do this. <laughs> so, well, that's fascinating. And I think many of us actually, uh, Madra, have retreated slightly into memories of our childhood. Mm -hmm. um, I know I, I was setting out to find old albums and um, you know books and things that I'd owned as a child, which I'd since lost track of. So yes, I think it's a, it was an opportunity for all of us to reflect. But mm -hmm. your reflection on, on Alice is, uh, in your essay, your story, uh, is, is really interesting because of course you pick up on something which the, the Hatter mentions at the tea party, uh, because he talks about time and says to Alice, you know, time's not a thing. It's some. It's a person. It's a. It's a. He has an identity. Uh, something Tim Burton, of course, picked up on in his second Alice film. But um, tell me. Well, maybe tell me why you decided to use time, and then please give us the pleasure of of reading your chapter, which is called "Discovering Time." Um, thanks. Well, um, actually, I thought that this was such an obvious theme that you probably would have seen it a million times. <laughs> So, um, but I decided when I was kind of laying out different ideas for chapters, uh, this was the one that came strongest to me. And I thought, oh, everybody will do that. And then I decided I was just so passionate about it. I'm always trying to control time. I'm like Alice, I'm giving myself advice about time and not listening to it. And um, I decided, you know, you're a writer, you have to follow where the passion is. And so I went down this one anyway. Good. Well, um, before you, you've said you're as a writer. So mm -hmm. what, what is your experience as a writer? What sort of other writing do you do? Um, well, I do a lot of nonfiction writing. I, right. uh, I have an adult son with Down syndrome and we advocate together. I have a book for parents on Down syndrome. And then my son and I have a children's book that's out, uh, Black Day, the monster rock band. Thanks for the pitch. <laughs> and <laughs> um, we... Uh, we write together a lot, and uh, but of course, fiction is perhaps more fun than nonfiction, and so I en really enjoyed this contest and and other prompts like this to kind of, you know, escape. Well, that's lovely, Madro, and and perhaps we can hear discovering time. Great, thank you. Alice quickly discovered that a griffin holding her hand was not such a pleasant sensation. Then, when she protested at his digging talons, he growled a grumbling that sounded like a lion, though it came through a beak. They began the incline to a steep hill. He let go of her hand and opened his wings, leapt up, 
and took her by the shoulders. In a moment, they were both in the air. Oh dear, I wouldn't want to offend him now, thought Alice as she rubbed her wrist and watched the ground move away. Yesterday, she would have been afraid, but today she'd fallen so far already and she wasn't entirely convinced that gravity worked the same here as at home. Everything else is so curious. Why not gravity too? Alice thought. Plus, they weren't flying awfully high. Why, just this afternoon, I was taller than this. Quite a distance ahead, she saw creatures of all sorts streaming toward a garden gate. That must be the trial, she thought, then noticed directly below them the dodo in a heated argument. The dodo banged his stick and looked red in the face in as much as one could tell behind all that beak. The something he contended with phased in and out of sight and changed shape upon each incarnation. Is it the Cheshire cat? Alice asked herself. This figure is taller and there's an arm and hand. No, it's definitely not a cat. She called up to the griffin. Sir, who or what is that with the dodo? Aye, that's time. Would you like to meet him? The griffin placed Alice upon the ground, then stretched his legs to land behind her. So the hatter was right. Time is a he, Alice mused. I should say so, as there he is. And he grumbled under his breath, extra courses indeed. So the hatter is not mad after all? She pressed on despite the griffin's arbitrary tone. Oh, no, no, yeah, the, rather yes he answered, the hatter is most certainly mad. Just because someone speaks with truth doesn't mean they aren't also mad. Cricket. As they approached the dodo, his flickering companion continued. I stop for no man, child, beast, or bird, or any combination thereof. Although he wasn't entirely visible, time seemed to have turned his attention to Alice and the griffin. Then the voice turned back to the bird though I am sorry, Dodo. The Dodo's shoulders bent, so the griffin put his, week over him, his wing over him and escorted him with soothing words down the path. But what about the hatter? asked Alice. What about him? You stopped for the hatter, Alice stated sternly as fact what she had heard. Dear child, the hatter broke his watch and fosters a penchant for excuses. Alice squirmed a bit, having been so forthright with considering the Hatter's statement, maybe a fib, or at least a mistake. Time continued. The clock and I, we are not the same thing, you know. Wheels and gears, a machine to track me. His voice faded, then snapped sharply back. But gears and bells are no match for my march. But you did quarrel then, Alice asked more timidly than her last accusation. He let out a sigh. It's true, we did quarrel. The problem is Hatter has plenty of imagination, but no discipline and less confidence. So he blames me for all. He claims you keep him at tea time. Is that why he is considered mad? Alice thought better the Hatter is mad than a liar. Just another excuse, that is all. Every single moment he tells himself, after my tea, I will pick up my quill. Now I ask you, what care the, the clock bell chimes? If you have a word, a song, a job, then do it. Do not squander on excuses over me. Until you start, you will never be done. Time's form flickered in and out as he spoke, appearing both full and fat, then reappearing thin as a rail. His hands often showed first and left last, and he moved them around as he spoke, never still. He's not the only one quick to blame me. Men of business and laziness and artists of all sorts are known to do the same the world over. They can slander me all they like. My brother, Truth, is also there all along. Why do you fade in and out so, grow fat and thin as we speak? Alice asked. Ah. I am often wasted away, you know. What do you mean? You see that sloth? Time pointed to a circle of sloths in flat caps. The tallest looked very much like an older boy she knew from school. He grinned at the other two sloths, rubbed his paws, then threw his dice into their circle. They waste me on dice and bets. 
I am lost to them and they will miss me when I'm gone. Time sighed before his figure nearly disappeared, then filled in again like a balloon. Whereas a man reads a book, finishes a project, or awakens his soul on an adventure, and I fill up, full and satisfied, like from a favorite meal that was cooked with love. Time looked taller and fatter than ever. Then he dissolved again. The shifts were no longer startling to Alice, and she had learned from speaking with the Cheshire to continue facing the place he was until he appeared in whatever place he is to be. His voice from the empty place further explained, I break up and divide too, you know. When a mother sings a lullaby, she stretches time for her and her babe. I expand then fraction, fraction into all the futures. I'm more than time then. I'm a warm blanket that rocks with each heartbeat and I feel the space between breaths in the darkness. Sir, are these riddles or the truth? Though she had once craved the nonsense, Alice now felt tired of the constant confusion this day presented. Oh, do you know truth? Time appeared suddenly and quite close, causing Alice to jump. I think so, but today I've been so muddled that I'm not sure. Good, those fully sure they know truth have seldom met him. He should be on his way by here soon, as there's a trial, you know. Unfortunately, he's so prone to be betrayed, lost, or disguised, he rarely makes it into courtrooms. Barristers the world over lay traps in his way. Pity. Of course, here the queen demonstrates no desire to see truth, so I doubt he was even invited. I've noticed that too, said Alice, feeling an agreement as good as knowledge. But the queen cares for you, does she? What makes you think so? Well, she was concerned for your murder. You know, when the hatter sang. Alice felt quite smart to continue pressing time on his ways with the hatter. Pish posh, murdering time doesn't happen in a song. It's easier to kill time than anything else. My true destruction comes when dreams are ignored and passions buried. But time appeared fully before her and pointed to her directly. The Hatter was right about one thing. No need to beat time. Just move with the rhythm and I will join you. Sing as you walk and you'll see what I mean. Yet again, Alice was commanded. So she took a deep breath and sang with each step. Twinkle, twinkle, chime the clock. Get up, get up, no time to gawk. Twinkle, twinkling each raindrop. Look up, lean in, no time to stop. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Each adventure more bizarre. She watched her feet and felt the hand of time on her shoulder as she sang until she bumped right into the dodo. I say, young lady, do watch your step, he exclaimed, and Alice quickly jumped back. That's just what I was doing, watching my steps, Alice explained. I should think a child like yourself, a winner of a thimble, if I'm not mistaken, would be more careful, puffed the dodo, adding, and courteous. I do apologize. It's been such a long day, and I, she looked about her, I seem to have lost track of time. You too? I'm afraid it has abandoned me altogether. The dodo choked back a small sob. Suddenly overwhelmed with compassion for this silly looking creature, she wanted to reassure him. Stiff upper lip, dodo. Her father's words were the only answer she thought of. And then of course she immediately regretted it as the dodo clearly had no upper lip to stiffen. Yet he nodded anyway, pulled out his handkerchief and gave a loud blow of a nose that didn't exist either. Ah. Uh, very wise words, my dear. Alice smiled that someone finally recognized her effort. Let us proceed, he continued. Then with his right claw on his stick, he put out his left wing and Alice laid her hand upon it. He escorted her past the gates and into the courtyard where the trial was soon to begin. Lovely, thank you very much, Madra. Uh, I loved, well, not, not just the, the cleverness with which you picked up on on the time theme, but also the way in which you explored 
uh, the tenuousness of time because uh, and truth as well, of course. Uh, so the moral dilemma of does time actually exist and why does it seem um, bigger or fatter or thinner uh, is something we all puzzle about endlessly. I think waiting in a doctor's waiting room or in the dentist's uh, waiting room is uh, time takes forever. And yet when you're having a nice, pleasurable time, it whizzes by. So I'm sure even our youngest uh, uh, people here today have thought how puzzling that is. Uh, so I really, really enjoyed it. And I, I, one of the things I was wondering was to ask you was, were you, were you aware, are you aware of just how many other people have wanted to, at uh, various times in history, ever since the books first appeared, to make their contribution? Because I wonder what it is about this particular story that 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 cries out to us to add to it, to you know, put another chapter into the book and write a a, a, a third book or a fourth book or a fifth book. What what is it do you think that that makes that draws us to that? Well, um, actually, this is really, this is fan fiction, right? We're all yeah. adding to characters we already know. And I think that fan fiction is, a, is an incredibly powerful way for writers of all ages to kind of get into something, particularly if you're stuck. This was, uh, you know, this was great for me because I felt really stuck as a writer and to have this prompt, so to speak, really broke me out of a rut because these were characters that were already established. I, I felt safe going into this world. And uh, I, I think that's true. I, I sometimes have occasion to speak to young writers and I'm always encouraging them that fan fiction is a true thing. And this is a great example of it. And can you imagine, you know, Lewis Carroll thinking how many 150 years later people embracing and running with his original ideas. It's just, it's great. Well, he was very interested, Madra, in, in those that were written in his lifetime. I mean, he mm -hmm. certainly followed uh, the, with interest the people who were producing another Alice story. Um, uh, what, what does a book need? I think you're absolutely right about fan fiction. But if we look at the kind of books, obviously, uh, books about, um, I don't know, Hobbits, um, Peter Pan, James Bond, uh, Wind in the Willows, Winnie the Pooh, what Mary Poppins, what, what does a book have to have, do you think, uh, in order to make it the kind of book that people feel comfortable with wanting to add on to? Well, of course, these books are particularly good because there's so many, you know how it was mentioned earlier, the chapters could really go anywhere in between, and the characters are so completely out of this world that adding new characters is is not out of the question you know you're not you're not confined to a set time or place because everything about it is so imaginary so you can really run wild like the young people did just amazingly that we heard earlier too just running with the character one thing that fascinated me that i didn't go into was who is the who is the narrator of this story and that's one other thought that i personally was like that would be the next thing I'd like to discover and, and write about and explore with him. Thank you, that's great. Um, uh, Caroline, did you enjoy hearing time personified in this very, very visual way in which uh, Madra conjured him up? Yes, I thought it was fantastic, Madra, and it just seemed to fit so perfectly. I mean, I really do think that, you know, if it was sitting there, nobody would ever guess that it didn't that it had been written by somebody else and that it was you know that it didn't belong so to speak from the start I thought it was wonderful um I think it was brilliant that you chose to you know to characterize time because it is such a big theme um and actually I don't think we did have that many entries which who were brave enough perhaps to to tackle that um and I love the fact that you also went for for truth as well because because um, that brought in another aspect as well. And my goodness me, we could, I think truth has been a bit absent, perhaps a bit around here recently, hasn't it? Um, and I love the twinkle twinkle that you did, you brought that in as well. It was another lovely part of it. No, absolutely wonderful. Well done. Thank you. Thank you so well, much. Well, thank you, Madra. It's a great contribution. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Uh, and our next contributor uh, is Jerome Malenfant, 
Uh, and he's written a piece. He's sadly not here to read it for himself, which means that I'm going to have to read it to you. So I'll do the best I can. Um, but uh, Jerome uh, is himself quite a character. He's written uh, a number of books. You can check him out on, on Google quite easily, including a book called Bad Poetry and Other Things, uh, which includes quite a lot of humorous poetry and specifically nonsense poetry inspired by Lewis Carroll. So Jerome is clearly uh, somebody who is fond of Lewis Carroll and his books. Uh, he's also in, in, he's a, a retired physicist and lives in Southern California, Bachelor of Science degrees in, degree in physics from the University of Michigan, a master's degree of applied mathematics. So obviously he would have an interest in Lewis Carroll as the magician, as the mathematician. Uh, and he was also a magician, but I don't know whether he's interested in, in him as a magician as well. Uh, and the writer of a number of whodunits and crime thrillers. So uh, of quite a, a diverse range of writing. Uh, and his chapter is chapter six. Uh, it, and it, it is the one that would follow the immediate uh, episode uh, from the where Alice encounters the caterpillar. And uh, she's, if you remember at that point, then in fact, his opening, uh, the, the opening paragraph is actually from the book itself. Um, so if you remember, Alice has eaten the mushroom and got herself to her right size. And it's called A Quantum Alice. And I point out that this is, whilst offered to us as an additional chapter, is very much a parody. And as I said earlier, Lewis Carroll was very, very aware of people who were writing uh, stories about Alice, using the Alice characters to make a, a social or a political point. And of course, that's gone on ever since. And cartoonists, including uh, Chris Riddle, who we were talking about earlier, and many, many others are still making cartoons and writing spoofs of Alice using these characters that we know so well to make political or social points. So here we are. This is all about quantum physics, and it's called A Quantum Alice. It was so long since Alice had been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first, but she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come, there's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are. I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got back to my right size. The next thing is to get into that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? And so Alice sat down beneath a big tree to think. Proposition one, she began. A path goes from point A to point B. Proposition two, I am at point A. Proposition three, I wish to get to point B. Conclusion, I must find a path from A to B. Feeling very satisfied with herself, she looked around about her. But there are no paths in this forest, she said, and sighed. But when she looked down, now she saw a path that began at her feet and meandered away through the trees. I'm certain that wasn't there before, she thought. But under the axiom that a path must invariably lead somewhere, she decided to follow it. This particular path, however, seemed to have never heard of that axiom and showed no inclination to go anywhere at all. It simply looped around and tied itself into knots and went every which way. And pretty soon Alice found herself right back at the very same tree that she had started from. Only now there was a large grey cat sitting in it. Approaching the tree, she began, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? Now that depends a good deal on what you mean by the words way, go, and here, said the cat. Unperturbed, Alice tried another question. Uh, what sort of people live around here? And followed that with philosophically precise definitions of here, people, live, and just to be sure, what sort and around. Satisfied, the cat replied, in that direction, waving a paw, lives a hatter, and in that direction, waving the other paw, lives a March hare. Visit either you like, they're both 
postmodern philosophers. Alice looked in both directions while thinking, but I don't want to go among postmodernists. When, when she turned back towards the tree, however, she was quite surprised to see a scruffy orange cat where the grey cat had been sitting. Uh, please, sir, uh, could you tell me where the grey cat went? Alice asked politely. The cat sniffed at her and replied, now, dear, I've been sitting here by myself all day. And as you can see, I am an orange cat. I have always been an orange cat and always will be an orange cat. Then, just as he was, as he was about to start into his familiar recitation of how his ancestors had all come over with William the, of Orange, which he regularly bores his friends to death with, he changed into a white Persian cat and then into a Norwegian forest cat and then into a black and tan tabby. Alice, feeling proud of herself, for they had just covered the new theories coming from the continent in her lessons the previous week, realised then that he was actually a Schrodinger cat. Your wave function, she explained, as much to herself as to the cat, consists of a supposition of different eigenstates, of which a catness operator, although she did wonder why his wave function, after collapsing to an eigenstate, didn't stay collapsed like a proper wave function. Perhaps it's artistic license, she thought. Then to show off her new knowledge, she launched into a long discourse on wave particle duality, entanglement, and both the Copenhagen and the many worlds interpretations. Stuff and nonsense, replied the cat. Being a cat at a 19th century one at that, he was of course a firm believer in Newtonian determinism and would have none of this newfangled Germanic uncertainty. Just thinking about it, he said, made him quite giddy. Alice then noticed a large steel box with an open trap door at the top, lying on the ground behind the tree. I see you're admiring my box, said the cat, smiling. It is a lovely box, isn't it? A gift from a human pet of mine, although I'm not certain what all that stuff inside is for. Moving closer to the box, Alice could see a complicated apparatus inside with a Geiger counter and a broken glass vial. She thought it best, though, not to look any further for fear of what else might be in there. But when I saw you, asked the Siamese cat who now sat in the tree, and you inquired about a Mr. Dodson, didn't you have rather short, dark hair? Alice thought this question very curious indeed. Perturbed, she started to wonder if she might likewise be a Schrodinger Alice and consist of a supposition of Tenniel Alice and Little Alice states. Alice was certain she would not care for that at all, for it would cause all sorts of confusion. These deep metaphysical waters were beginning to make poor Alice's head quite dizzy. She sighed and thought it was time to say goodbye to the Schrodinger cat. She had seen Hatters before, so she decided to pay a visit to the March Hare, even if he was a postmodernist. She thanked the cat for the directions and started down the path. But after a bit, she wondered, did he say this goes to the March Hare's or to the Hatter's house? And turned around to ask him. In the distance, she could just make out the cat in his tree, only now he was rapidly disappearing and reappearing in a quite curious, shimmering sort of fashion. Then she remembered what her tutor had taught her about double slit experiments and quantum interference. She decided not to disturb him further and continued to propagate down the path. As she did, she tried to recall what Derrida had written on the deconstruction of mid 19th century Victorian literature. For it is almost certain to come up, she said to herself. So that's Jerome's uh, story, well, a parody and a spoof, uh, using Alice to write about quantum uh, physics. Um, I, I have to say it was a challenge for me, Caroline, I don't know whether it was for you, it was a challenge to read. And um, 
uh, and as somebody who is a million miles from being a quantum physicist or anything even close, remotely close to it, quite a challenge, but clearly uh, a very cleverly wrought uh, parody. And you read it absolutely brilliantly, Brian. You managed to put, you know, so much meaning and uh, characterization into it. Oh, well, thank it, it you. made it very, very excellent. Well done. <laughs> well, it's fun. And and while I while we're talking about it, um, one of uh, one of the people online, um, and I'm just trying to f find back to where it was, because uh, I know it was it was uh, Michael uh, Everson who wrote and uh, was talking about when I raised the the, the matter about bishops. Uh, yes, here it is. Um, he reminded me that in the 1895 sequel, A New Alice in an Old Wonderland by Anne Richards, uh, that uh, bishops do appear. And, and as he says, uh, re remark beautifully drawn by Richards' daughter. So, yes, Alice has been used for just about everything. I mean, most recently, I'm sure that most recently must be out of date already, but, um, you know, recently there have been things like the Brexit Alice and so on. Uh, and uh, Alice just goes on providing all of those uh, cues and clues for people who want to take the story, which we all, stories, which we all know so well, and those characters and use them to make a political point. I mean, in the last, uh, certainly in the last couple of years, I've seen our, our Prime Minister, uh, uh, Boris Johnson, being depicted as both uh, the monstrous Queen of Hearts uh, and also as the dithering White Rabbit. So, you know, all things are possible. And certainly um, ex-President Trump uh, has also featured in many cartoons and, and spoofs. So, uh, you know, Alice as a creation is so remarkable in the way in which uh, it, it has, it is all things to all people and can be all things to everybody. And, 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 and we love it so much that we actually enjoy seeing the way in which it's used. And I think Lewis Carroll would have as well. He might have disapproved of some of the, the subjects to which it was uh, it was used, but uh, as an idea and, and as, certainly as a writer to be flattered by having people use your work and recreate it, I think is is uh, must be an, an amazing thing to experience. Uh, if we can go to our next slide, our next uh, entrant is actually with us, so we can we can actually talk with him, Jonathan David Dixon. Uh, Jonathan uh, is. I have to say something of a renaissance man because uh, he's not just a, a writer he's also an actor he's a composer uh, a performer in, in all kinds of both on stage and before the camera and uh, born outside Washington DC lived in Southern California uh, Minnesota and Oregon and is uh, steeped in his fascination for Lewis Carroll. Um, I might mention that he illustrated an edition of The Hunting of the Snark. Um, he, he produced a book which may not be uh, a title many of you have heard of, but if not, you can look it up. Uh, it's a puppet play which Lewis Carroll wrote when he was a boy um, to, to entertain his sisters with. Uh, the play was called La Guidia de Braja, and La Guidia de Braja is based on what was then the railway timetable system called Bradshaw's Guide. And he's also illustrated a book about the mouse's tail from Wonderland. So, Jonathan, lovely to have you with us. How far back does your fascination with Lewis Carroll and, and the Alice books go? Uh, I think it came sort of backward because I got interested in the hunting of the snark when I was looking for something to illustrate. And then I decided on that it hadn't been overdone um, or definitively done. So then I went back and did tons of reading of Lewis Carroll just to absorb it um, as much as I could to so he would soak out of my fingertips. So then I read everything. So it sort of came from deciding to do the hunting of the snark and then working backward. Uh, I, I, I was listening to that question to some other people. When did you first read the Alice books? And I thought, I don't remember, because I think I had absorbed so much through the years that at that time when I was in my early 20s, I thought, have I read them or not? Because I felt like I had, but I didn't know if I really had. So I went and really did it. And so I, I think I was in my 20s when I really read Alice and started learning about Mr. Dobson and um, reading his letters and reminiscences of him. And uh, Carolyn, I just wanted to mention, I spent a lovely day with your dad in uh, almost 30 years ago in his garden. And it's still one of my highlights of visiting the UK. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Thank you for that. 
Thank you. He showed me a first edition of The Hunting of the Snark, so oh. got a photo of that. And behind you, are, are those some of your some of your puppets, um, yeah. Jonathan? Uh, yeah, uh, I had to put them here. Um, so in 2008, the uh, North American Society put out La Guida de Braja, and I was the first person to illustrate this work of Lewis Carroll's, um, which there aren't many of those around. So then the year after that, the theater company I was with theater work decided to put on the first production of La Guida de Braja since Mr. Dodson's own back in the 1850 or something like that. And it was sort of a big hit. So yeah, I, I ended up with a puppet that's Mooney and Spoony here. Uh, there they are. T tell me, tell me about their characters because they work on a on a railway system, don't they? Yeah, um, the so some some people have called them sort of proto Tweedledum and Tweedledees. Um, so uh, you know, I don't really. I drew them that way, sort of fat little guys, almost identical looking. Um, I don't know what they might have had in their background that he would have, if he had, would have based them on anything or not. Um, Do you find it interesting uh, because you've explored his early years and you know uh, about the things that he was uh, doing as a child, as a young man, yeah. you know, his writings and, and his drawings, because he was also uh, doing little sketches and cartoons as it were. Um, do you think that the, that the fact that he was kind of steeped in storytelling from his childhood has something to do with the success that he then made as a storyteller later? Well, I think he was must have just been a natural. And um, well, what you find out is being the oldest of a ton of kids, he just took on that role of being the entertainer. So I, I imagine there wasn't a time in his life when he wasn't doing it. So it was just him, I think. One thing more I'd like to ask you before you read to us is, yeah. is about the Englishness of Alice and why it appeals, do you, do you think, to so many Americans? And one of our, uh, well, in fact, I think our next contributor uh, is someone who is, is, has taken a very particular American take on the, on the story of Alice and combining it with a very American um, uh, heroine. But... What do you, why do you think it is that the Englishness has this appeal? Is it because it's English uh, for American audiences? Yeah, I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I've never felt like an American, really. <laughs> third grade, my, my teacher in third grade read us The Hobbit, and um, he was, was explaining the different spellings, and I thought he was giving us a choice. So the English ones always felt more right to me. So I <laughs> And in 92, when I went to England, what just arriving into London and Victoria Station, I was like, oh, like, oh, finally, this is where I belong. So I'm not the person to ask that question, I think. Um, OK, well, I know how English you are, because I, I remember that I think uh, when we first uh, encountered one another, it was in a very English pub, having a very English pub lunch. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go there and just go, oh, this is it's like a puzzle piece fits in with another puzzle piece. <laughs> Jonathan, back, yeah. Sorry, go on. I was going to say when I'm here, it's always like a constant, if you know, music theory, G7 chord that never resolves down to the C or where it's supposed to. So, so I, I can't answer that question. I think it. There I think was, you have. I think you have answered it actually okay. in, in what you've said. For you, and I think probably this, everybody has their own answer. Um, yeah. tell, tell me about the idea of the other Alice. Where did the idea come for this? Well, it was probably going back years and years when I was researching Lewis Carroll and for to do the hunting of the snark. I just had little ideas constantly popping in my head, and I would quickly write them down, just not expecting them to go anywhere, just to get them out, like in the middle of the night little Lewis Carroll type ideas would come up. So that I went back to one of those where she meets somebody who looks exactly like herself. And I guess it's kind of based on the idea that if you, that somebody said, if you meet somebody who's just exactly like you, you'd probably hate them. So I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, and, I, and I think, I don't think a lot about this. Um, it's more intuitive, but going back in hindsight, looking, I think Lewis Carroll did a lot about identity. 
So this sort of, in hindsight, ties into that theme in, in his work too. Would you like to read it to us, Jonathan? No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, of <laughs> Look, I had to read the last one. You're going to have to read this one. No, okay, here I go. Okay, The Other Alice, a missing chapter from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in 1,652 words. And I'll start with a little bit from the one beforehand. Um, the Lobster of Quadrille, Chapter 10. Come on, cried the griffin, and taking Alice by the hand, it hurried off without waiting for the end of the song. What trial is it? Alice panted as she ran. But the griffin only answered, come on, and ran the faster while more and more faintly came, carried on the breeze that followed him, the melancholy words, soup of the evening, beautiful, beautiful soup. Chapter 10 and a half, The Other Alice. I can't keep up, I haven't wings like you, called Alice to the griffin as they flew along the sand at great speed. Come on, the trial, shouted the griffin again, never once looking back. But Alice simply couldn't keep pace with it, and at length her hand slipped from the griffin's paw. The griffin continued on, unaware it had left Alice behind and still calling out, come on, until finally Alice was left standing alone on the beach, trying to recover her breath. It never even told me what the trial is about, she said. I hope it isn't its own trial, as he was quite the nicest griffin I've ever met. Since Alice had never met any other griffins, that would have been true even if the griffin had been extremely rude and unkind. Well, I might still make it without arriving too late, I think, but I suppose I should probably tidy myself in this looking glass first. I don't want to appear in a courtroom looking a fright. Alice walked over to a looking glass that was standing within a circle of large rocks that surrounded a small inlet pool of water. What an odd place for a looking glass, thought Alice. She stood before it and smoothed the front of her dress, brushing away some stray particles of sand that had got there, and then reached up to straighten her hair. Strangely, however, the looking glass Alice didn't return these gestures, but simply stared back at her. How very curious, the other me seems to have a mind of her own, said Alice. What are you looking at, said the looking glass Alice, whom Alice suddenly realized wasn't a reflection at all, but a real live girl. Alice jumped back. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were a looking glass. Do I look like a looking glass, asked the other Alice. No, said Alice, I just meant that you, you look just like me. Why? Do you think you look like a looking glass? Asked the other Alice. No, said our Alice, who was beginning to realize she wasn't quite sure what a looking glass really looks like. I just meant we look the same. It is really, that's quite remarkable. No, it isn't. You see, that's the difference between us right there, said the other Alice. You look exactly like me, but I look nothing at all like you. A thought occurred to Alice. Do you, she began, do you suppose we might be sisters? Alice had once read a story about two little girls who looked exactly alike, but who didn't know they were sisters until their lockets fit together at the end. Maybe, said the other Alice. I hope not. What is your name? asked Alice. Celia, said the other Alice, whom we will now call Celia. Alice waited for Celia to ask her her name. She didn't. Alice decided to press on. But my name is Alice. She thought it best to spell it out. A-L-I-C. Yes, yes, I see as well, interrupted Celia. But what is your name really? My name really is Alice, said Alice. Celia looked doubtful, but said nothing. And what is your last name, Celia? asked Alice. I never changed it, said Celia. I meant, what is your family name, said Alice, who was beginning to feel more than a little annoyed that this other little girl didn't seem the least bit impressed that they looked exactly alike. If I had meant that you used to have a different name, I would have said, what was your last name? No, you wouldn't have, said Celia. You would have said, what is your last name or what was your name? 
If I had changed my name, my last name would continue to be my last name, even if I had one, which I don't. Well, said Alice, my name is Alice, and my family name is... You have very thick ankles, interrupted Celia. I do not, said Alice, and it's very rude of you to... Oh, you're a mermaid. Alice was surprised that she hadn't noticed this obvious fact before, but sure enough, in looking down to see how thick were Celia's ankles, she found that Celia not only didn't have ankles, she didn't have any legs at all, but instead a long, beautiful blue tail like a fish. I'm a what? said Celia. I just said that you're a mermaid. I didn't mean any, of any offense, said Alice. No, I am not. I am just a maid. You're a tear maid. I'm a what? said Alice, who didn't think herself a terror at all. I am not. Oh, ho, laughed Celia, now whose shoe is on whose other foot. Well, if that's how you're going to be, I will just be on my way. Alice turned on her heel and started toward the road. Stop, you girl, commanded Celia. Against her own best intentions, Alice found herself stopping. She turned back. Where were you going with that bird? asked Celia. W with the griffin, do you mean, said Alice. It said there was a trial. We, we were trying to get to it before it started, but the griffin is, was ever so much faster than I. Celia looked deeply skeptical. If there was a trial, how could you get to it before it started? Even a very fast bird couldn't do that. I meant... Of course, said Alice, becoming even more annoyed, that there is a trial right now, starting at this moment. You don't want to go to that, said Celia. Why don't I? asked Alice. You just don't. You should come with me under the sea. I could show you the most lovely things that would broaden your outlook, Celia pointed toward the waves. But I wouldn't be able to breathe under the sea, protested Alice. That would only be a problem for a minute or two, said Celia. We could ride the currents. Mer, I mean, you ride currents under the sea? Alice didn't even know that currents grew under the sea, let alone that it was, impo that it was possible to ride them. Oh yes, all the time, replied Celia carelessly. It's lovely. How very peculiar, said Alice. Well, that does sound lovely, but... Really, I must go to the trial. It sounded to be very important. No, you mustn't. I want you to stay here, said Celia. A thought occurred to Alice. I suppose you have a song or a poem for me, she asked. Why would you suppose that, said Celia? Well, it just seems that almost everybody here has a song or a poem, said Alice. As a matter of fact, I do have a poem. And a song, said Celia. Many, in fact, but they are not for you. They are for art. Well, in that case, if they aren't for me, I will be going, said Alice, turning away again. It is an epic poem in the style of Lord Denizen, continued Celia, taking no notice of Alice's clear desire to be gone. It is very romantic, but tragic. Would you like to hear it? I'm sure it would be far above you. Well, I'm sure you haven't the time, said Alice, taking another step away. Perhaps its nobility will raise her up, said Celia to herself. She folded her hands and began. An epic poem entitled On the Death and Lamentable End of a Truly Noble but Quite Insufferable Whelk as Told to One Fine Octopus in His Childhood, or A Crustacean Without a Shell. Here, Celia cleared her throat and lifting her hands wanly and using them to fan her hair out on either side of her head, began. Lo, upon the heartened grandee never took, the seasoned whelk did sink below. Here she let her hair fall, and pressing the back of one of her hands to her forehead, she held the other out before her as if in futile protest. Alas, for what? Tis that we sometime overlook. Our seaweed left in splendid flow, here Celia crossed her hands before her face and lowered her eyes. She remained in that attitude unmoving for several long moments.
Was that the introduction? Alice asked finally. No, that was it, said Celia, dropping her hands. It is a very short, epic poem. I knew it would be above you. Here's one more to your level, I think. This is the song. Then, with a beautiful soprano voice, much better than Alice's own, Alice had to admit, she began. Shall I compare thee to a dishcloth rag? Thine eyes are still more green. And yet I find they do not get the table half so clean. Shall I compare thee to a broken comb? Thy face more radiant fair. And yet I find it cannot work the tangles from my hair. Shall I compare thee to a rusty gate? Thy voice more lilting far. And yet it will not keep the pig from... At that moment there came another cry. The trial's beginning! This time followed by the sound of a trumpet. I'm sorry, but I really must go, said Alice, tearing herself from Celia's song and running toward the road as quickly as her legs could carry her. She heard a splash behind her, glanced back, and saw that the mermaid was gone. Well, I can't say I'm sorry to get away from her, thought Alice as she ran. Even though she did look like me, she wasn't a very pleasant person. The griffin by now was only a dot far, far ahead, and Alice had to run her very fastest to try to catch up with it. When she did finally reach the griffin, she found it in heated conversation with several of the other of the animals, standing before the entrance to the courtroom, and they all walked through together. Chapter 11, Who Stole the Tarts? The King and Queen of Hearts were seated on their throne when they arrived. Jonathan, thank you so much. That was a, a great story and brilliant read as well, as I would expect. Um, I, I just immediately give you a, a comment from one of our uh, people here today, Mark Davies, who writes, uh, neat, neat idea to choose Celia as the other name, of course, an anagram of Alice. I was going to say earlier that Cecilia is also a very good name in this context because I see Alice in a muddle. So I'll leave that with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I loved uh, all the the, the, uh, the wordplay, the, the little, the, the verse about a dish rag, etc. shall I compare thee to, uh, is absolutely, totally in the style of, of uh, Lewis Carroll without any doubt. Um, Caroline, what do you think your great, great, great Uncle Charles would have thought of that? <laughs> I think he'd have loved it. I think he'd have probably been very flattered by <laughs> that. It, it was uh, uh, wonderful and the most precise sort of emulating of his style completely. I mean, just wonderful. Um, I love the concept of um, the other Alice and the looking glass in the, on, the, on the beach and everything. And um, I just thought it was brilliant, wonderful imagination. And um, as you say, the, the dishcloth, song was was brilliant <laughs> lovely um no i thought it was really really good and i think it would have really appealed to him definitely <laughs> thank you cal i'm I, you know jonathan one of the things i want what want to bring out which people won't know because they hit, heard you reading it and superbly though you read it they won't have seen it written down um, i hope they will at some point but at the moment they haven't uh and you were very punctilious in observing Lewis Carroll's very, very particular style of punctuation, weren't you? And indeed, for those who know this, there was a certain time in Lewis Carroll's life where when he wrote letters or entries in his diary, he used purple ink and you chose purple as the colour for the font in writing this story. So uh, this isn't just a, a piece <laughs> of writing, it's a piece of a kind of a Carolian art that you've created. Well, yeah, actually I tried to form format it like the first edition of Alice and I did study his punctuation to try to figure out the rhyme or reason to it I still can't figure out any so, <laughs> has anybody ever um, well so you're right I mean <laughs> words like can't you know he insisted on spelling it c-a apostrophe n apostrophe t because of course it's quite right because the c-a should be followed by an n and the n and the t <laughs> should be divided by an o so yeah you're right a very punctilious way of doing but uh, we love that and I think you actually I remember you were saying that you wanted to correct one bit of it because you just you'd spotted something that you hadn't done quite in the in the in the correct style. 
Somebody pointed out I had used the American version of skeptical, and I didn't know there was one. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you managed, you managed to correct that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Well, we, we're coming almost to the end of, of our time here now, but we've got one more uh, entrant uh, who's waiting to um, delight us, I'm sure. Um, T.M. Bradshaw, but uh, can I call you Terry? Terry? Are you still with us? I'm, I, I'm just oh, unmuted. Yes, are. please oh. do call me Terry. Uh, oh, oh, you gave me heart failure there for a moment. I thought I'm going to have I'm to read here. another story. Um, <laughs> now, you are also uh, something of a writer. You live in, uh, you come from Stanford, New York, USA, but uh, you have lived, uh, well, Stanford, of course, at one point was, was known as part as the queen of the cat schools. Um, uh, the cat schools, am I right in thinking it was, was uh, would have been the location for Rip Van Winkle's uh, exploits? Somewhat east of here. Right, okay. Um, but uh, not but, far. But you've been you've written about aspects of, of the, the area in which you live, including, tell me about this character um, whose name was uh, Ned Buntline. Is that how it's pronounced, Buntline, Butlin? Uh, I was told by the historian that at the time, it would have been pronounced Buntlin. Ah, right. Uh, but with the silent E at the end, um, to, we all say it Buntline. Uh, his real name was Edward Zane Carroll Judson. He wrote under Ned Buntline. He was the king of the dime novel, which he had originally railed against. Uh, just terrible, terrible thing, terrible literature. And then he wrote three or 400 of them and made quite a bit of money. He was making about $20,000 a year in 1860 and around there. He was uh, involved in the Astor Place riots. He was a multiple bigamist. He was married nine times to of eight women that I've found. There might've been others. <laughs> And then there were other ladies interspersed. And he was responsible through his uh, the, these dime novel literary creations. If if uh, if you follow his uh, his earlier argument and think of them as not being literature, but let's call them literature uh, of creating the pers the persona of a character which we think of as a uh, as a kind of archetypal American hero character, Buffalo Bill. Yes, he had uh, on a, a trip west, he was also um, a heavy, gave temperance lectures. And on a trip west, he had planned on coming back on the first transcontinental train, missed it, stopped in Nebraska to find out about um, a particular Indian raid and tried to interview the lieutenant involved to use him to see if he could write a, a story about him. That gentleman was not interested at all and, and said, why don't you go speak to that scout over there? Uh, and that was uh, William Cody and they got along quite well hunting together. And then um, after coming back to New York, Ned wrote a book about him called The Wildest and Truest Story I Ever Wrote, which was full of all kinds of fake <laughs> um, including that William Cody was a good temperance man, which Cody had once admitted that he enlisted in the army because he was so drunk he didn't know what he was doing. And it became a play that Ned wrote in either four or six hours, I forget which, and one critic wondered what took him so long. Um, a tremendous popular success and after a year of well from December through June of touring um, Ned had all kinds of plans for the next year of touring and Bill said uh, see ya and went along and got Wild Bill Hickok involved instead. Well fascinating because you know it, it, it probably couldn't happen today but it was 
in a period when it was possible for for people to create whole personas for themselves. I mean, real genuine people, but became mythologized in their own lifetime, really. So tell me about what about Alice? When did you first discover Alice? I first read Alice, I must have been eight or nine. And I had had both books together in one volume. So for me, I always thought of it as part one and part two, uh, even though there were very few characters from part part two. Um, and the ones that were there were different, uh, like the White Queen, who's sort of a little bumbling and, and vague and and in in in, Al in Wonderland, and then she's sort of a speed demon in in Looking Glass, and kind of interesting. Uh, but I always loved her. So tell me loved about Alice. your your and uh, your story. I, I was saying earlier that that, that uh, there was a contribution which involves Alice uh, with uh, what is probably the great American equivalent of Alice the Alice stories, and that that book being L. Frank Baum's The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. When the instructions for this competition were you existing characters or you can add a new one. Um, and I started to think who would be appropriate. And then I remembered an actual physical scarecrow I made for a, um, a local competition which was the three, the Cowardly Lion and the Scarecrow and the Tin Man all twisted together in the twirl and thought, now that would be interesting. And what would he need from Alice? He'd need help. And how would he get there? Which involved checking a few dates on um, copyrights to make sure I had them in the right order because it wouldn't do to use something that didn't exist yet. Uh, and it, it seemed to all fit. And it was a great deal of fun. Well, it's a great deal of fun to, to read as a story. Because, uh, by the way, we have a picture of that, uh, of that scarecrow of yours. And if we, could, uh, if we could perhaps flash that up onto the screen, we can see uh, the, the, there he is. Um, uh, so yes, he's got the, the, the hat of the Tin Man, the lion's head, uh, the kind of rustic smock of the, of the scarecrow and uh, reverting back to obviously Tin Man feet at the bottom. It's a brilliant creation. But, but in a sense, there's quite a, there's not a direct similarity, if you like, other than that it's two girls that are drawn into another world um, uh, and a world very different from, from their, their own world. But um, there's something about the, the character of Alice and the character of Dorothy, it seems to me, that they're both very uh, self-reliant, very strong, female characters uh, and the fact that they have both endured in American literature and in English literature and indeed both of them have crossed the Atlantic to entrance people on the other side of the pond um, that they are they are unique as characters at the time when they were being written because they are so different from the average kind of female characters that you would have encountered in books of the time. What, what, what appeals to you about Dorothy and, and Alice as characters? Just both charming, helpful, intelligent children. Um, just lovely people. Yeah, and also, of course, self, very self-reliant. I mean, they are they're strong, fairly strong-willed. They're, they're not going to be pushed about by anybody, whether that's uh, um, screaming queens or um, um, wizards hiding behind curtains. <laughs> so anyway, let's have your great story, which is called Yet Another Lion, Along With Others. And this follows uh, chapter seven in Through the Looking Glass, which ends with Alice on her knees and covering her ears to drown out the sound of the lion and the unicorn being drummed out of town. Alice tried to think of pleasant things to distract her from the pounding noise. Over time, it changed to a whirring sound and then a metallic banging. 
when it had grown mostly quiet, except for an occasional gentle clunk like a cowbell announcing Bessie's arrival back at the barn, Alice felt a soft, wispy, somehow dry rain on her head and hands. Many odd things had happened, but the idea of dry rain seemed perfectly reasonable. She took her hands from her ears and rose from her knees, brushing what proved to be straw from her hair. Alice, a deep voice inquired. Yes, I'm Alice. She started to say, I'm having a little trouble. Wait a second, sorry. Um, yes, I'm Alice, she started to say, but drew up short when she saw the creature who had addressed her. It was a lion, but not the lion she had just left and only partly a lion for his arms and legs. Yes, arms and legs for this lion stood upright were made of metal and larger straw bulged and fell from his shirt and bib overalls. Yes, shirt and overalls. The lion, Alice felt that must be what to think of him as for his head, that of a lion, idly stuffed bits of the straw back into his shirt while speaking. You've been hard to catch up to. We've been close several times. Alice answered politely as she could. Sir, how do you know my name when I don't know yours? Forgive me, the creature said. Some have called us the Cuddly Tin Scarecrow, not a name we care for, but together we've never had another. You must have one, Alice said. Everyone must have a name, and to be fair, you should have three. How about Bert Rajak? Hmm, is that two or three names, the creature asked. Both, arranged to look like a proper name. Of course, it's a proper name. All people's names are proper names, even people who aren't people, but lions and other things. Yes, Alice said hesitantly, of course it's a proper name, but I meant a real name, a regular name, a first and last name. Alice had been to not ask personal questions, but saw a perfect opening to satisfy her curiosity. Are you a knight, Bert? Is that why you wear armor? Armor? We're not wearing, oh, I see, you mean our arms and legs. Alice hadn't noticed before, but Bert also had a long, dun-colored tail with a tuft at the end. Just now it was serving as a fly swatter. You see, just before the witch melted, she conjured up a small tornado to spin us together. It didn't take effect until Dorothy left, or she would have helped us. Alice wasn't sure she believed in witches, but she hadn't believed in disappearing and reappearing cats or playing cards that painted or unicorns or talking flowers or white rabbits who wore gloves and had housemaids named Mary Ann neither. Why not witches then? Am I supposed to know of this witch or Dorothy? Alice asked. I must admit I'm not familiar with either nor with the us who were mixed together. Uh, of course, we all happen after you. Will you cut us a piece of that plum cake? We'll tell the tale while we eat. I couldn't cut it before when it was there, so perhaps I can now it's been eaten. And true to the logic of looking glass, more cake was on the plate. As Alice offered the plate to Bert, the cake divided itself into two different sized pieces. It was a quarter of the whole, the other three quarters. The big one's for you, Alice said. Bert took a bite and began their story. A long time from now, almost 30 years, I'll be living in Oz, a lion with a big problem, cowardice. A friendly scarecrow and a tin woodsman will also live there. They'll have their problems too the tin man feeling hollow inside and the scarecrow just not very smart. Excuse me, Alice didn't like to interrupt, but something didn't make sense. How do you know what will happen in 30 years? 
Does your memory run in both directions, the way the White Queen explained? 30 years? Why, by then, I'll be old. Bert laughed hard enough as more straw to fly about and the nested segments of their legs to jangle like wind chimes. We've met old people and don't think you'll be old in 30 years. Even a regular girl of your age wouldn't be old that soon. And you, Alice, we don't believe you'll ever be old. To answer your question, we know what will happen because we've just come from there. From where? From 30 years from now, from another book. Alice was puzzled. I like books very much, but what have books to do with it? Everything, replied the lion. Alice couldn't help believing she was speaking with a lion, one who just happened to be part metal and part straw. We're from a book, one is a book, this is a book, and we used a book to get here. As strange as many of the things Alice had seen lately, this seemed strangest of all. This is not a book. I was at home explaining to the black kitten why she shouldn't unwind the wool when the looking glass turned all gauzy and I slipped through. But this is a book, the lion insisted. We're from a different book. In our book, there was a sweet little girl named Dorothy. She helped us all, and when she went home to Kansas, we missed her a lot. See, Alice said triumphantly, Kansas is real. I read about it in a book my governess has, although it's not a very interesting book, not enough pictures. So you must be real. Books, books about made up things, can mention real things. Kansas was the problem. Because it is real, we couldn't go there. We can only travel to other books. There's logic to that, I suppose, Alice said dubiously, except Dorothy got from Kansas to Oz. But you said you came here in a book. What did you do? Sit on it and fly? Bert gathered up another small bundle of straw and stuffed it in the gap between two shirt buttons. No, of course not. The wizard, there was a wizard in Oz, left behind his library, he left for Kansas. We found the one called the time machine and tried to use it to follow Dorothy, but it didn't work. We can travel in time, but only from book to book. So we read his books looking for another nice little girl and found you. We hoped your experiences here and in Wonderland might mean you can help unscramble us. Alice always tried to be helpful, so she immediately began thinking of options. Well, there is the Red Queen. She's very fond of shouting, off with his head. Would separating your head from the others help? Gulped and put a paw to their throat. No, no, that wouldn't help. I know, I know, Alice screamed with glee. You can sit on the wall next to Humpty Dumpty and he can push you off. When you smashed on the ground, all the king's horses and all the king's men can put you back together as three separate beings instead of one. Bert rubbed their left knee. We don't think we'd like being pushed off a wall. The king's horses and all the king's men good at that sort of thing? Perhaps not, Alice said, tapping her finger against her chin. What else? I know, we'll go back to where I found the eat me cookies and the bottle. If Wonderland has potions that make one grow and shrink, perhaps there are separating pro potions too. Perhaps, did you notice anything like that? Well, no, there was nothing on the table, but there might be. Oh, I know, the monstrous crow. When it flaps its wings, it whips up quite the wind. It could fly in circles around you and make a tornado. Please, no monstrous crow, we almost caught up with you when you were with Tweedledee and Tweedledum, but the crow scared us away. Alice cradled her chin and tapped her in index finger against her cheek. Remember the words the witch spoke in the spell? Maybe we could, maybe we could say them backwards. Bert shook their big shaggy head. Couldn't even say them forwards. 
Just then the white queen came running out of the woods, an ivory blur, hair and shawl flying. Wait, Alice cried, they need help. The queen skidded to a stop, a plume of dirt and leaves. Hello, dear, what needs to be done? I'd like to help since you were so helpful with my hair and my shawl. Bert here was twisted together with some friends. They need a separate again. Hmm, will scissors help? No, Bert cried, we can't be cut apart. We have to be untwisted. Yes, Alice said, added, it was a magic tornado. A magic tornado, a magic tornado, hmm. Well, an anti-tornado might be just the ticket. If I can get going fast enough, Wittish, of course, and say the right words at the same time, that might do it. And the queen started to circle Bert Rajak faster and faster until she was going so fast, Alice could see her everywhere along her route all at once. And all the while she still somehow had enough breath left to chant. Round and round, above and round, in the sky so very high. Twist away, twist around, twist unbound, or I'm not crowned. Over and over again. As the made her ninth circuit, an amazing thing happened. Bert began fanning out from the center, top and bottom, until it, it seemed Bert was turning into a snowflake or a star. Tin legs emerged to the left, straw-filled overall covered legs to the right, a lion's hind legs in the center. Arms followed the same path and a head sat on either side of his lion's mane. The queen continued until the division was complete with the tin man and the scarecrow standing separate, flattered after her 15th trip. Somehow, Alice knew that the lion should remain burst. You did it, Alice cried. So I have, the said, plopping down at the base of a tree to catch her breath. Thank you, your highness, Berth said, and thank you, Alice. Bert got in the time machine and began adjusting levers. Ray Scarecrow tried to join him, but couldn't fit. Oh no, Jack Tin Man said, there isn't room for three. Wait, I know, Alice said. He drew a small cake from one pocket and a bottle from the other. Here, two of you eat some of this and get small enough. And when you arrive home, drink some of this to get back to your right size. But which two, Ray asked. I must drive, Bert said. These levers need more strength than you have, Ray. And Jack, if you froze up while driving, who knows when and which book we'd land. That makes sense and things rarely do, the queen commented before getting up and dashing off into the woods. Goodbye, Alice called after her, turning back to the machine. And goodbye to you, Bert and Ray and Jack. Goodbye, they cried, almost, but not quite in unison. The machine started with them and soon reached a roar. Alice dropped to her knees again and covered her ears against the clamor. That was absolutely lovely. Thanks so much for giving us that. It's a real, a real treat because uh, it's a tribute to Lewis Carroll, it's a tribute to L. Frank Baum, and incidentally on the way, of course, is also a tribute to Ray Bolger um, and uh, Jack Haley and Bert La, who were the, the original characters to, for playing the, the Lion, the Tin Man and the Straw Scarecrow. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Loved it very much indeed. Caroline, did you enjoy uh, finding yourself uh, somewhere between Wonderland and Kansas? Yeah, I thought it was absolutely wonderful, such fun and um, a brilliant concept to be able to get these these the, the, well the, the Alice together with the with the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion. I thought it was just great, and I love the fact that time also played a part there. Um, and that the, the getting smaller and bigger by eating the, the, the uh, cake was, was there as well. And I thought it was a lovely idea about traveling in books as well. 
um, which was very clever. I think you did it brilliantly, a really novel and exciting idea, lovely. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Carl, I totally agree. And of course, in a way we all travel uh, in, in books and that's part of uh, the, the pleasure and thrill of books that we, that we can travel. Uh, in opening a book from anywhere in, in the world to places and worlds that we can't ever reach or don't even exist. So uh, that was lovely. I'm going to hand back now to our chair because we're actually coming up to being running this, uh, this uh, event for nearly three hours. It's two hours and three quarters. So I think it's time to bring our chair back in and let him do a bit of work. So over to you, Stephen, from, from Caroline and I. Uh, we've had a we've had a lovely time listening to all these stories and uh, talking with people. I think that's true, isn't it, Caroline? A real a real treat. Um, it feels very festive somehow. Everybody being able to do all this and uh, be together across the world. It's it's fabulous. And gosh, the the you know the spectrum of all these different stories and the imagination and everything as I said as you said Brian I think I think that uh, Lewis Carroll or Uncle Charles as we say in the family he he would have been really he would be really flattered that people 150 years later were still you know taking Alice on new adventures and things absolutely lovely thank you everyone yeah and thanks for me too and I'll hand back now to Steve our chair well, as I said at the end of the first half, I think that because all of the material is so new, it's not like um, me, myself and Brian and Caroline and other things when people can have any set questions. I can just really echo the observations that they both made, you know, looking at these stories, the, you know, the mashup is really good. Um, quantum, I mean, it's just a breath, you know, the, the mathematics, the physics, um, you know, all of the idea, there's performance art as well. I mean, Jonathan's piece was almost performance art as much as anything else. Um, so we have so many different interpretations and also, I would say, um, different aspects of it. And if I look at the first and the second half as well, I mean, really, I'm just dealing with a bunch of writers, regardless of age and history, have all shown that they, they love creative writing, they've got a particular point of view, and, um, you know, and, and whether you're eight years old or um, more than 40 years old, I just encourage you to, you know, to continue doing it. I mean, what I'm going to do is, um, instead of just having a few people, I think that, um, Brian, if it's okay with you, I'll open it up. Uh, just a few bits of tidying up really to do in that um, the marketing bit for us is that if you do want to join the society, have a look on the website where you saw the writing competition um, and also um, have a look. We, you know, we have a small shop on there and there are lots of things which are heavily discounted, not just the diaries, but there are other books about the life of Lewis Carroll and um, maps of where he lived and things like that. There are small um, booklets that um, you should be able to have a, have a look at and see if they're interesting for you. And they may make a nice Christmas present for you. So that's my, that's my marketing and sales pitch for the, um, for the society. If you've got other ideas for other events or other ideas, uh, I'll be honest, myself, Brian, Caroline, Will, um, Miles has helped me out with this. All the people who've got involved have really enjoyed it. You know, we've enjoyed reading it. Um, the judging part of it, there was lots and lots to work through, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a chore because all of the work, as Brian and Caroline said, was really of a high standard, very creative. And um, and if you've got any ideas of how we can, well, I think we've got one idea in that one way or another, we are looking, <laughs> we are looking to see how we can um, capture this in either a book or, or somehow so that's another discussion that we can have and it looks like Michael Everson seems to be very interested in this as a as a future thing as well um but yeah I mean I just can't congratulate you know someone has said that you know, I mean I was worried that it would be more than an hour and that people would find it nowadays you know quite difficult to concentrate but we've had really eight super pieces of work that's because they're unpredictable 
you know, they, they've kept us engaged all the way through. So I thank everybody um, you know, for all the work you've done and for you know, your participation, your support, your ideas, you know, and you, you know, you're a great catalyst to the things that we're doing. So what I'll do is I will, um, I'll unmute, see if I can unmute everybody so that um, I can um, allow you to unmute yourselves. So if you want to unmute and ask any questions, feel free to do so. I mean, also ask um, myself, Brian, um, and Caroline any questions that you might think we can, you know, be able to answer. Uh, one observation, I mean, um, believe you me, both Caroline and Brian are real experts, but um, one observation about when um, it was Carl was writing, one of the things he really liked was the theatre. So one of the things that affected his style was that he went to see lots of theatrical productions and they were very short, you know, they were, um, we're, we're not allowed to unmute yourselves. Let me double check here. Let me um, see here. Stop this one. See if it works now. Let's see how I can unmute everyone at me now, apart from myself. Oh, okay, try and unmute now. Yep. Super. <laughs> <laughs> But I've got nothing to say, so I might just as well mute myself, no. except to say thank you to all of those entries, which were just terrific. Everyone so different from each other, and all of them really good. Thank you. David, it's been, and you know, it's, it's a shame. Um, I think we've lost our younger participants, or some of them, but it was so nice to see such really creative, fantastic um, stories from younger people. Um, obviously, the others are, are really good as well, but it was just so nice to hear them and hear them read them themselves. Um, it was a real treat. Yeah, I think I'll put my email to the participants. So the reason why we chose this time, which is quite unusual for the Lewis Carroll Society, is so that we could enable um, Anne had as well, you know, who's in India, um, Cecilia, because it's quite, you know, on a school night, it would be quite impossible for them to participate. We still have Alexander and, oh, we, yeah. still have, and we still have... Um, and Chris Madra and our later contributors. Um, but yes, I'm mean, quite a long time for our younger contributors to sit through. But um, <laughs> uh, really, uh, just going back to what, what we were talking about earlier on is just when the when the submissions came through, I don't know about Caroline, but uh, I had no kind of idea of just having said that, oh yes, I'll be a judge for this, just how many would be uh, submitted and we I don't think any of us were expecting quite such a uh, a plethora of, of entries I mean huge numbers uh, and suddenly although it wasn't ever a chore as Steve has said it was certainly a challenge because you really felt you had to because people had spent so much effort and and uh, talent in in making their contributions that you had to give them uh, as much time in in reading them and, and talking about them. But one of the things we didn't say actually, but uh, is the case is that um, across all the categories, um, both uh, Caroline and myself and Will Brooker, the other judge, were very much in accord with one another. Uh, and in fact, even where one of us may have placed 
one of the stories higher than another. I think it was the case in all the categories that at least two of us had always chosen those same stories as the other as two of the others if you see what i mean so when it came to just trying to work out how many who was going to win uh, it was really quite simple because we were able to discuss a whole uh, slew of stories but all of them were ones that we had placed in a, a at least a category which we shared with one of the other judges so you know that that was that was brilliant we didn't have to try and win other judges over to our point of view because all of us at least two of us had always picked one of those stories so uh um it was a, it was a joy and that we had a good discussion i think caroline didn't we with will and spent a good time chatting about the, the stories that we'd all picked absolutely yes it was extraordinary that you know because we we must have read what almost 200 stories, I would think. Yeah. And, you know, I think I was worried that we would all come up with different ones and then need to <laughs> persuade one another. But it was amazing that actually, you know, the, the, we, we have, we've all chose sort of the same ones in our top five of each category sort of yeah. thing, which was, uh, yeah. was all, the, all the people who are still here and those who've already left were all amongst our joint selected uh, um shortlist as it were so uh yeah that was a that was a fascinating uh obviously not a coincidence because it showed that the quality of the entries was as high as it was and of course the quality of the judging as well but no i mean chiefly the quality of the of the entrance because uh, well, linda, sorry, a, a sorry Brian, i think um linda wants to say something oh yeah I just wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, I just wanted to add, it's been such a pleasure listening to uh, such a huge diversity of voices, stories from all over the world. What a joy sitting here in the desert of Arizona. <laughs> I have no questions. I just wanted to say this has been quite wonderful. Oh, that's very kind. Very yeah, kind. Thank you. It, 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 it is incredible that, you know, we've gone from India and over to the States and everything, and we've just had so many different themes and topics, and yet they've all shared a little bit of that magic, which is wonderful. And we had um, entry, I mean, obviously from the States, we had also entrance from Asia, from Hong Kong as well. Um, I mean, one of our challenges, I mean, if three and a half hours, almost four hours has been a long time, you know, initially, I mean, Caroline had to restrain me because I was starting off with 12. <laughs> so, I mean, if it was 12, it would have been, we'd be going to... We'd have been here away beyond <laughs> bedtime. <laughs> and I was, you know, I, mean, I wonder what I was thinking. I thought, you know, well, Brian does 30 seconds, <laughs> they bang it out for five, you know. Do it on a calculator, multiply by 12, that's two hours, no problem. <laughs> but, but it's not possible. I mean, even the people who weren't um, performing today, I mean, there's lots of writers as well and creative people who are on the, who are on the call. And it's, and it's good for people just to share their experiences and their, their thoughts as well. You know, it's a, if anyone's a writer, you, one piece of advice is you, you need a very good support network with you as well. Well, it'll be interesting to look out for those names of all those budding writers and amongst the younger ones as well. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I think I'd like to pick up on what Caroline said, because these days you don't really get things that are read out. You don't get readings, you don't get story times and things. And I think in this time where we're in COVID, it's, you know, to the fact that everybody's joined together on a Saturday morning, afternoon, evening, um, for such a time it went incredibly quickly I have to say but it's so lovely just to hear that spoken word and the stories read out because the stories have just come to life um, over the last three hours and, uh, and particularly um, Alexander I appreciate you for sticking it out so long because detention wouldn't be this long if you'd done something <laughs> bad <laughs> <laughs> Did you have some favourites, Alexander? Um, I thought all of them are very good. Right. Okay. You've, got a, you've got a job in a diplomatic corps lined up for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, was, I think I struggled. I mean, I was writing notes, you know, but 
you know, it was pointless really because they were all so different. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't compare, for example, the quantum one, you know, mm -hmm. against Jonathan's, you know, oh, and Neve as well, um, because your pictures popped up. And because they were all, they were all so different, you know, and took a different um, aspect of it. And even though everybody, so Brian and Caroline, myself, think we know the story so well. When someone else is looking at it, they take, I mean, well, take Neve's bit, not them trying to embarrass you, but, um, you know, focusing on Humpty Dumpty is really, you know, it was quite, you know, it was quite something. Ah, and we've got Kevin as well. And so Kevin's the, uh, the person who creates a lot of the websites and sort of half designed the writing competition as well. It does lots of things in with other um, pieces of literature as well and publications. So I picked, I'll be honest, I picked Kevin's brain quite a bit for the writing composition. <laughs> well, you did a good job. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it, um, I mean, Neve, Alexander, have you got any questions for Brian or um, Caroline while you've got them on the hook really? Uh, not particularly. <laughs> That's a relief, Alexander. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, just out of interest, what got you into Lewis Carroll in particular? Um, for, I mean, for me, um, I think it was a few years. It's a, a few years ago. Well, I tend to was going away on one of these staycations just for a, a week. And I went up to Whitby and Scarborough for three days in one, three days in another. And when I went to Whitby, I didn't know anything about Lewis Carroll. I mean, I'm not too sure that I even read it when I was young. Um, I may have watched bits of it on Disney time, but when I was around Whitby, they mentioned it. And I went on a, one of those tour buses. And then when I went to Scarborough, it was just a coincidence that um, they had a, an art exhibition of John Tenniel. And then about a month later, I was back at home and an email came through from the Lewis Carroll Society. And they were doing a film night with um, Dr. Jonathan Miller because he directed a very famous version in the 1960s, 1970s, which is, you know, which is brilliant. Alice, Alice in Wonderland, um, very atmospheric. And actually the, um, the girl who played Alice in that, and I will embarrass you, Neve, looked a bit like you. <laughs> like Alice, uh, but me and uh, me and Jean went to see it um, in London, and it was just you know it was fantastic. And then a little later on, um, I got an email, and um, and then I went along and I did a talk, something like this. I went along and I did a talk about um, Lewis Carroll and management thinking, and it was all a bit of a joke. But um, and that, you know, so I ended up meeting Brian and some other people as well, and just getting more and more involved. With Brian, I mean, Brian, what about you? Well, for me, it began very early. Alice was the, Alice in Wonderland was the first book that I ever didn't read, by which I mean it was the first book that was ever read to me. And I had a big, large, it seemed very large at the, at the time, but then when you're a child, books and houses always seem bigger than they truly are. But I had what seemed like a very large red book, which had all kinds of things in it, puzzles and stories and poems and pictures, but serialised through the book in separate chapters was Alice's Adventures in Wonderland uh, with uh, John Tenniel's illustrations. And I fell in love with the story. I don't really know why it was read to me, along with the other things that were in the book about which I remember very little. Um, but I really loved it. And even before I could read, whenever my grandparents arrived or any unsuspecting aunt or uncle, I would lug this book over to them, sit them down and say, please read me this. And as with so many children, I got to know the story so well, even though I was not at that point a reader, that um, they couldn't, when they got a bit bored, when grand grandpa got a bit fed up and decided to skip a few paragraphs, I would uh, immediately know that he was cutting the story and would make him go back a bit and pick up on the story. So I, it was, as I say, it was the first of all the books that I've read and loved. So it's a very special, special relationship with me. Um, I didn't read Looking Glass until many years later. And when I read it, it was in a rather cheap edition, which we didn't have much money a, a, as a family. Uh, and uh, I've I had a copy without any illustrations, but that didn't really matter to me because I kind of imagined the characters for myself. Um, 
And then fast forward to 1966, which is the year in which Jonathan Miller made his television um, a film. Uh, and he was scheduled to appear at a, 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 a center in London called the Institute of Contemporary Arts uh, to give a talk. And so I immediately bought a ticket to go to this talk. Jonathan Miller didn't turn up. In fact, for some reason, I can't remember why. Uh, I had to wait for quite a few years more in order to interview him at the event that Stephen Jean came along to. Uh, so that was many years later. But I rolled up at this event and there were lots of other people there, uh, including a couple of people who had written, put together a new book called Aspects of Alice, which looked at all the different aspects of the Alice phenomenon, which I wasn't aware of at the time, things like uh, the Jungian inter interpretation or the Freudian interpretation and, and, and parodies and spoofs and all kinds of things. Um, an interesting, but rather for me as a young man, a pr rather provocative book. I wasn't sure I agreed or approved of it entirely, but I met at that, at that meeting, I, I stood up being young and, uh, and uh, impossible to suppress like the, uh, like the uh, dormouse in the in the in the book, um, I uh, said a few controversial, made a few controversial comments, and afterwards some people came up to me and said, "Oh, you know, we belong to the Lewis Carroll Society. It had only been founded, I think, a year before or eighteen months before. And why don't you join?" So I did, and uh, then that the rest of it was a case of getting on a committee, being invited onto a committee, being sec made secretary, being made chair and then um, going away and having uh, a rest for it a bit and fiddling around with other people like Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and then coming back. So uh, it's been a presence in my life always. And I guess for Caroline, because she's part of the family, it's always been a presence in your life. Um, well, I have to say that I probably had a rather unfortunate introduction <laughs> to Alice <laughs> because my grandmother arrived when I was four or five with a, a copy of Alice and um, she I think she just inscribed her name in it and said something about this was written by my uncle and um, I literally got hold of it the next or a few days later and I was at that stage of practicing writing wherever I could grab a piece of paper <laughs> and I started to draw and practice my name in the front of the book which my father was just horrified about <laughs> so then whenever I read it you know or tried to pick it up and read it I always had this awful feeling of guilt that I'd let the family down by <laughs> scribbling in this book <laughs> but um, actually as the time went on um, I think where I began to really appreciate it and and love it was by being with my the times we spent with my grandmother and my aunts and as a family um, and then all the other aunts and cousins and things and there is a very strong uh, sense of whimsy and sense of humor in the Dodson family uh, my grandmother and as I said was the most amazing storyteller and we would arrive at her house and rush up to her bedroom and sit on her bed and she would just continue to to just tell us stories out of her head for hours on end and we would have to be called down to lunch or whatever and and really complain about having to break off from this story um, but also as I say there was always a wonderful sense of humor of, and and um, sense of whimsy and playing on words and all this sort of thing that used to go around the the family with um, stories that were told in the uh, around the dining room table and this sort of thing. So, and then just hearing her memories really of of him and the rest of the Dodson family um, in Guildford, where she used to go and stay. Um, and I think they they were a very close family, and they all really sort of made their own entertainment. They were used to doing that from having had so many children and, you know, not having the devices we have today that they had to make their own entertainment. So uh, a lot of it fell into place then, I think, probably. <laughs> and I guess of what we tried. Oh, sorry. It just must be amazing having such a lovely family history. <laughs> being part of an amazing group of people 
Yeah, I feel I feel very blessed, really, that, um, as I say, my grandmother particularly, you know, remains a great um, inspiration in my life. And um, and as I say, I don't think I'm nearly as good a grandmother these days because I can't sit there and just spout stories left, right and centre. <laughs> Unfortunately, if only I could. <laughs> But it is interesting and and one hopes that, you know, my grandchildren who are young, but that they will eventually, or I have got a little granddaughter aged five and she is Margot Alice and she absolutely loves the Alice books and will spend every time we go there, you know, she'll pull one out and say, oh, can we do this? Can you read me this? And of course, these days there are some wonderful books, aren't there? Not only with illustrations like Chris Riddell but also these ones with little bits that fold out and um, things that move and of course for a child of five they absolutely love that <laughs> and I think the Dodson family would have loved that they'd have thought wow you know what a what an imagination to be able to create and to to take the story into that sort of um, medium yeah <laughs> I think I think Lewis Carroll would have thought, why didn't I think of that? All of that polite yeah. stuff. He would be yeah. kicking himself. Look at that market I missed out on. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> oh dear. I have, I have to say, it's really quite something. I don't know what he would have thought, but Alice pays my rent, man. I don't know how <laughs> it happens either. And Alice <laughs> in Latin. People buy oh. this every. Year. I guess he gets put on courses and things like that, you know. So. Um, right. But uh, but uh, I thought I mean he, he liked marketing the thing and he likes the translations. I don't know what he would think about ninety translations, but there you are. Well, what is this? One hundred and seventy now or something? I it's, published ninety of them. Gosh, <laughs> including ma ma magnificent things like uh, uh, like Alice in Shore, which is a, a Turkic language of Central Siberia spoken by two thousand people. Incredible. Someone has to. Yeah. Think, so is there think, a language that still has to be translated, you know, into? Oh, lots and lots and lots. I'm translating, I'm translating it into bliss symbols, which is a symbolic language that was invented as a kind of utopian thing that would bring world peace in 1949. Failed to do that, but it was uh, discovered in 1971, I think, in Canada that you could use this language with non-speaking children, like with cerebral palsy and stuff, as the only way they could talk to other people. I've been working with bliss symbols for 23 years, I guess, and I'm doing a PhD involving it now, which also involves my translating Alice into this language. Recently, I translated Jabberwocky into bliss symbols, which is quite something, making up nonsense words in a language with no pronunciation. There are no sounds in bliss symbols. It's only a written language. It was so much fun. Can so I ask if you... Do you, do you still publish Esperanto? Do you get uh, much call for that? Uh, oh, no, I, yes, I publish lots of things in Esperanto. I mean, I think uh, Treasure Island will come out this year. And um, like, yeah, I, I like Esperanto a lot. I published Dracula last year, in, or this year, in, uh, in, in, in Esperanto, which took, which took the translator about five years to, to accomplish. It's a very long and complicated text and i'm not sure that bram stoker wrote very well but everybody likes his ideas you know it's really good fun have you, have you used the shaw alphabet uh michael i have published alice copy? in the shaw alphabet yes yeah and also I, in lewis carroll's nictographic alphabet and yes, also in did. the deseret alphabet used by the mormons in the 19th century well you were quite right in saying that he was very interested in uh, in the translations, I mean, he was incredibly uh, over those, all over those uh, productions. I mean, the the colour of the cloth that was used, the way it was typeset. Uh, I mean, Macmillan, if you look at his letters, as you know, I'm sure, if you look at the correspondence he had with Macmillan, his publishers, uh, it, he wasn't daunted by the fact that we were talking about an, a French, German or Italian edition. Uh, he was getting stuck in there and, and uh, involved with what it was going to look like. So um, 
I think it's one of those strange things that people think about Lewis Carroll, that he was somehow this shy, retiring uh, Oxford Don who, you know, hid behind this pseudonym uh, that became more famous than his real identity. But in truth, of course, he loved uh, all the attention that he got. He didn't like people finding out where he lived and sending him letters through the post. And then he would write crotchety letters back and say, I do not know who Mr. Lewis Carroll is, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but, but, but at the same time, you know, he was he was he was the first one to get involved in in uh, deciding, uh, yes, uh, whether somebody could have a biscuit tin with Alice figures on, uh, though he, I, I think he missed a, a trick in not ensuring that there was uh, a due royalty paid for the use of those images. Uh, the, 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 the operetta, the, 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 the stage show, which I mentioned, you know, he got stuck into everything, the lantern slides. I mean, he knew everything about what was going on with Here's what we would call today franchise. He wouldn't have known that word then, but that's what Alice was right from the beginning and has remained ever since. Amazingly, it is a franchise now. Yeah. Actually, so he was very particular about it all, wasn't he? Oh, yes. He quality. Got involved. <laughs> That quality was, you know, Caroline's absolutely yeah. right. I mean, it, if the quality of something wasn't up to snuff, he was uh, the first to complain and, uh, and get upset about it. So, yes, it had to be right, it had to be Parker. Yeah. Coming yeah. back to the subject of languages, um, a couple of years ago, we identified someone who translated Alice in Wonderland and through the looking glass into emojis. Ah. So, <laughs> so you could actually get a poster with the story as an emoji now. I'm oh not too sure goodness. how accurate the translation was. <laughs> and there aren't enough emojis to, believe me, because I'm doing it into a symbolic language, there aren't enough emojis to actually do it, I don't. I know, when you when you were talking about lips, that's what, um, that's what reminded me of him. I mean, I actually bought um, a copy of them, so at some point we may stick it up on the wall, because they look they look nice. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's not an accurate track. I mean, I'm not even well, but I remember him. Since then, they've added more emojis to, to, to this set of emojis, including, I must take a little credit for this, the dodo. <laughs> well, that would say him. So I was involved in getting the dodo and the mammoth done uh, in there. And we have a fairly good set of, 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 of Wonderland characters as emojis. I mean, we have the dodo, we have rabbits, and we have we have a top hat, which you can use for the hatter. Uh, I mean, there's a lot, there's quite a lot of the, I mean, I think it's quite fun. It is, and I, and I think that, you know, when we did the Lewis Carroll, um, I mean, Neve was asking how we kind of got involved and why we stay involved is actually because um, the interest change as well, you know, like the guy with um, the emojis, we've got people who, come from a, a physics background, chemistry, mathematics. We've, uh, there seems to be um, an interest in Matt, his logic. Uh, Lewis Carroll wrote some books on logic as well. And there is uh, a sudden spurt of interest in it. So once a year, there's a logic day on January the 14th, which is the birthday of some famous logic person and, um, and the day of the death of Lewis Carroll. And it's World Logic Day, and they celebrate lots of different logic things all around the world. So there are so many different, I mean, and Brian touches on things like the art, the v &A exhibition. There are so many things that go on, even when it's not 150 years of through the looking glass. There are people who are constantly rediscovering the work and using it as a catalyst to express ideas. It's, you know, it's quite, it's interesting. I have to say we have we have a VNA here in Dundee up in Scotland and oh. I really wish they would send that exhibition up here. I could bring 150 books along, you know, for the part of I mean, but I don't think they're going to do that, but it would be wonderful if they did bring the Alice exhibition to another VNA. Yeah, well if I give you another example, I suppose we ought to close it down after three and a bit hours soon. I mean, even this week even this week, there's a lady who contacted me and there is a production in 1940-odd called Alice in Thunderland, okay, done in London somewhere. And her 
grandfather was part of the production and she's tracked down transcripts and interviews and various other pieces and looking forward you know, and looking to to see how she pulls it all together and it may end up something that we cover in the Lewis Carroll Society but she did say that if she'd known earlier she would have donated it to the Victorian Albert Museum. Ah. Well, she could do that when she's finished her book. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's incredible. I'm sure Brian's Googling now just to, to double check. But yeah, it's quite, I mean, I've never heard of it. And I mean, you go to the Cartoon Museum and Brian knows a lot about all the, you know, Gerald Scarf and, and everyone else who've used it and, you know, political cartoonists. It's such a source of material. It's quite incredible. And mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of why I'm, um, you know, why I managed to remain involved. And in almost like every year, we find speakers to talk about aspects of it, such as um, I think last year we had a guy called American McGee, who's developed video games. Um, I mean, Michael Everson says he makes his money from uh, Alice in Wonderland. So does American McGee. He's made uh, several best-selling. Um, video games that are you know number one and he, and he lives in China and he's got the the only Chinese software development company um, that's there um, and, and we interviewed him we've got other people who uh, have used it as the source for writing um, thrillers um, there's you know it's quite it's quite interesting and I mean and one of the things we did this year we had a joint meeting with the Flann O'Brien Society so there are all these people, um, and I think postmodernists were mentioned in one um, in one story. And so Flan, Flan O'Brien is uh, a modernist. I'm not up on all the labels, um, but a lot of people think that Lewis Carroll influenced Flan O'Brien in his, you know, in his books. Um, so every year, even if you think you're an expert on Lewis Carroll, there are new connections or new interpretations and with all the new technologies that are coming out there's just you know there's just so many possibilities he would be flabbergasted i think <laughs> yeah. one of the things that i loved about about this whole thing today i mean i i've published some some sequels this is new adventures of alice by john ray i he wrote it in 1917 i think and 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 I've done did a bunch of those you know some years back and I'm preparing some new things for short anthologies of shorter things that just wouldn't make a book by themselves, including things like Alice in Virusland, which was a talk given in like 1955 to the American Society of Virologists. It's a work of genius. I mean, it's the weird thing that it it is. So I'm 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 going to be putting together some anthologies of that. I guess I'm going to call them portmanteaus because what else would I call them? Um, but it's lovely to see. I just love the idea of a new chapter, um, as opposed to you know this is a different book. Alice goes to a place, and there's the you know Anna Richards. It's a different Alice going to the old Wonderland, that sort of thing. But this is lovely idea of inserting a chapter here or there. You know what happened? How did she get from here to there? What happened on the way? I love it. It's a brilliant idea. Oh. I'm so pleased that we've had this today. This has been so much fun. Steve, can I? Um, I just thought some of you might like to see. I've got some photographs that aren't very good, so I'll only share one of costumes from a theatrical uh, performance, I think in the 40s. They're actually done by um, a, rela a relation of mine's relation, who was a theatrical designer. So if you'd like to see the dodo, I could show everybody. Um, I'll show them. Can you, uh, let's see, can you see that? Uh, yes, we can. But I've actually got more because the, when I last stayed with my cousin, the room I was sleeping in was was the room where all these pictures are on display. And I'm a bit confused because Shakespeare Company or the theatre, and I can't find her name attached to a production of Alice, but she certainly was a designer there. Okay. So I can share more. I'll try and do some more research. I did bring this to the notice of 
somebody in the Lewis Carroll Society a very long time ago, mm -hmm. and then it all no, they yeah, weren't. We we it's a, a beautiful drawing, Sarah. It's a beautiful <laughs> picture, isn't it? Mm, and mm. I know um, they're sort of, he's my um, cousin's husband's quite worried about what they're going to do with, they've got this archive. Mm. Okay, are there any other questions then from everyone so that um, so I can close it down so people can go and have their dinner? <laughs> <laughs> Or, or breakfast if you're in America. <laughs> okay, I just want to thank you all again. I mean, thanks for turning up. Thanks for all the contributions. I mean, Neve, Alexander, you're superstars, okay? I mean, that was fant fantastic Thank work. You. Fantastic work by, you know, Cecilia, everyone, you know, who's there. You know, Cecilia, Jonathan, um, I can't remember everybody's name off my heart. Um, Terry, there you go, the ones that I wrote down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've enjoyed it. I'm thinking going back to the start when me and Brian and Caroline were discussing it back <coughs> in January, and we never thought that we'd be still finding new aspects from the work that he'd sent in, you know, come December. And I think we'll follow up, um, probably speak with Michael as well and see, you know, what we can do as a, as a follow up. But definitely, I believe in that idea. You know, maybe maybe there's a future in um, in these books where you can kind of start off with the first four chapters of the story and then insert your own chapters as you see fit and buy them online. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, happy Christmas to everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank to you everyone. everyone. Great treat. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Enjoy. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Bye. Thank you, everyone.